Yeah, it's more than just the Constitution. This is American Issues Take Two uh, with Tim Apicella, co-host, and Stephanie Stoldall, regular contributor. Welcome to the show, you guys. Morning. Let me frame it like this, okay? We talked yesterday on take one um, about uh, Trump's remarks um, about the Constitution, uh, that he wanted to terminate the Constitution. No confusion what he said. And he tried to walk that back, but it, it doesn't work because he said it. So the question is, where does that fit in the continuum of Trump's behavior, the behavior of the GOP, the Trump GOP, and the other GOP? Um, and you know, and where does it go from here? I hate to call for speculation, but that's exactly what I'm calling for. Um, so if you if you watch the the Gantt chart that uh, Ari Melber, the, the Gantt chart that Ari Melber presented on MSNBC, you know that uh, Trump began with uh, you know less illegal, less seditious initiatives, and each time he was rebuffed. He went to more seditious initiatives, more desperate initiatives. And now, by you know, his comments around the Constitution uh, and taking that on the heels of January 6th, um, you know, we have a more desperate situation. And to add fuel to the fire, doesn't look so good for him uh, in um, Mar-a-Lago, uh, or for that matter, on the January 6th investigation. So you could assume uh, on the Ari Melber dance chart that it will be more desperate for him, more desperate times. And the question is, um, you know, how desperate will they get those times? And um, what will he say to his base, his old base or his new, more extreme base? Um, how will the GOP react to that going forward? And the bottom line question is, what will Trump do? And will it be successful? How damaging it will be for the country? Let's start with you, Tim. You, you, can you wrap around the question of how much support Trump is losing right now so as to make him more desperate? I think quiet, quiet support is, 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 is peeling off. Uh, they're not still yet willing to come out in front of a CNN or MSNBC or Fox you know, TV news cameras and say that they're done with them. Um, they're still concerned about Trump's 33% you know, uh, base, uh, the MAGA GOP, uh, which still seems to be red hot and still you know, quite, quite powerful and, and to these politicians quite Im um, intimidating. So, but I think deep down inside, they know he's done. They know that after the midterm elections and certainly yeah. after the, uh, Alab uh, the Georgia election, uh, Trump influence as a kingmaker is over and that um, most GOP, I think most, maybe 66 uh, percent, they have severe Trump fatigue and they're looking for the new the new candidate to come out into the marketplace and, and take the, G the GOP party into a new direction. And of course, that candidate's not out there yet. Um, everyone wishes and hopes that DeSantis is the one uh, they think that. He will, by polls, uh, he's already way ahead of Donald Trump, but uh, it's premature for DeSantis to come out into the scene. So we're stuck with Trump. They're stuck with Trump. And um, I think they want to move away as quickly as possible, but they just don't have anyone yet to, uh, to rally around. You know, the Georgia runoff is kind of iconic in the sense that Herschel Walker was his candidate. He put him up there. And supported him at least at first, and I guess then as a strategic matter, he backed away because he thought he was he was more of a you know a negative uh, factor than a positive one. Uh, but the lo Herschel Walker's loss to me had it's more than just um, Trump can't find a good candidate. I'll tell you what I think, and I like your opinion about it. It's that he used these primaries, these elections as a way to demonstrate his power and the, the threat that he could make against a sitting member of Congress was to say, I'm going to primary you. I'm going to bring in a Trump mm -hmm. candidate and then I'm going to support that candidate and that candidate will bash you when you're out of a job. 
But after Georgia, seems to me that the calculus for somebody, um, you know, who might be affected by that threat before may not be so affected now. What do you think? I couldn't agree with you more. Um, just real quick, remember the old attorney's refrain is never ask a question you don't have the answer to. Well, that applies in politics as well. And that is never pull off a political stunt you don't think it's going to go in your direction. And certainly backing all these candidates was that political stunt. It's, it was a barometer for Donald Trump to say, I still am you know, the kingmaker and I'm still the head cheese here in this party. But it didn't work for him. It didn't go in his direction. So like the attorney that asked a question and got the wrong answer uh, you know, in the uh, witness box. So Stephanie, um, you know, according to the Ari Melber Gantt chart, um, at first, the things that Trump was doing, say, before the 2020 election, were not necessarily provably illegal. And they were not criminal necessarily. I mean, it was arguable. But then when he began to get desperate, uh, and a good example would be January 6th, he went to more desperate measures, more criminal measures. And Ari Melber's analysis is that if you watch the Gantt chart, you will see that as he gets more desperate, the measures get more desperate and more illegal, more seditious. Okay, so I mean, somehow, I, I, you may or may not agree, but somehow his, his claim that the Constitution should be terminated seems at least as desperate as anything he's done. Because it not only uh, suggests um, you know, that he doesn't believe in the Constitution and the government, that he believes in himself, uh, Uber Alice, um, that and that he is organizing on that basis another attempted coup. So how serious is it in the continuum that he is now um, shoved off from the United States Constitution? And what does it portend? Well, I see what I consider in contrast to all that's gone on until now, a virtual route of him. The only person that's standing up for him is uh, Kellyanne Conway. And her big question about the loss is that, well, why weren't all the other 49 senators are out there, Republican senators, helping him out? There wasn't enough help for him. But he's being completely eviscerated by Hannity and other Republicans for his his um, requirements for Republicans to stop early voting and not use mail-in ballots and all that he told everybody to do and that they did has an impact on their their failure rate. So he's been he's been taken on for that all around. So we're not he's surely getting ready to come back something on that. But that those are the major uh, Fox people and commentators and and on the smart news and like that is that the, his he is seen now as a reprobate and one who got in the way of the Republicans winning all these elections and that if they hadn't listened to any of that, and that it is counterintuitive and that the kinds of advice that he put out was illogical. They're saying the same things that, that were brought up during the time that these he was recommending and demanding that his followers uh, act in that way. So I see him uh, as being moved into the corner but that in no way belies your theory here that um, he's going to come out fighting with something and we'll see what it is. And it, it will probably be ferocious, as, as it usually is as a first response to a very, very general route of him. So uh, I think we're going to have some interesting time. And it looks like um, Romney's out there saying things. So slowly, 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 they're stepping up. And I do believe I'm feeling that things are moving um, against him, and he's going to have to face up to some serious consequences here. Well, your reference to the, um, the remarks of Kellyanne Conway, I find very interesting. Uh, remember, you know, she was um, some official, maybe a campaign spokesman person uh, in 2016. And uh, she's the one who talked about alternative truth and I remember my my initial reaction is a holy moly how can a how can a presidential candidate lie, and and we found through Kellyanne Conway that that was a 
a, a cornerstone of his campaign, lying and then justifying it as alternatives. It was mad. It was insane. Um, and she was the spokesman for it. So mm -hmm. such a good forward, point, Jay. It's true. Well, and fast, built forward, up. fast forward six years, okay? seven years, whatever it is. Now, Kellyanne Conway, who has been out of the administration, and her husband, George, doesn't agree with her about anything. He appears, um, you know, uh, to oppose Trump every time he gets a chance. God, I wonder how their yeah. marriage is doing. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so now Kellyanne Conway comes back. She's been off the platform for a while. She comes back and she makes it. And what floods my, my brain is that mm, Trump could see all these people you mentioned backing away from him. He's, he's mm -hmm. trying to find somebody who will come under the spotlight and support him. Okay. And well, Fox he, he is too. Calls, that's why she's on the he panel. Calls a bunch of people. He calls mm -hmm. all his old friends and he says, would you, would you like to talk to me? I need a statement from you. And they say, you know, I'd really rather stay out of the limelight on this panel. Uh, you know, I, I won't, I won't come out against you, but then I won't come out for you either. I'm just going to stay on the sidelines. And he looks and he talks and he calls. And finally, he finds Kelly Ann Conway. He says, Kelly Ann, I need you to make one of those uh, alternative truth statements for me now. I need you back, Kelly Ann. And she yes. says, OK. And that's why we have Kelly Ann. What do you think? Well, Jay, I remember, you, you know, on, the yeah. love of money. Oh, I'm sorry, who are you talking to, Jay? Well, um, I was just going to say that, yes. Are. Okay. All right. I, I was going to say, Jay, right on such an important point, and I'm real, I'm real signal, signal of what's going on, and that he may have had to do with that. But, but I see that Fox is sputtering too. I mean, for 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 days and hours, you know, I'll check in on them, and they their coverage is like off the wall, Tanzania, you know, people's individual stories. Meanwhile, all this stuff is breaking on the other channels. And, and Fox is kind of like, even on the Five and all of these different programs, they're just ignoring so much of it. And I think that uh, it's Fox, too, that's helping Trump to bring people like Kelly Ann back, to your point, Jay, because they need somebody to speak for him. Uh, you know, Tim, you were talking about money, and we know that well, uh, whatever you want to say, Trump has money right now. Well, yeah, I mean, what, what's the correlation between Kelly and Conway back on the airwaves uh, supporting Donald Trump? She's getting a paycheck again from him. I mean, love of money is the root of all evil, and people will sell their souls, and that's what she's doing yet again. Oh my God, it's not a mystery. She's getting paid. So, yes. yeah, anyone who's getting paid, you'll see him in front of Fox cameras and uh, exactly. defending the, the, you know, the great Donald. But, uh, you know, um, that's great until Donald check starts bouncing his checks, which he loves to do. Which hopefully he might have happened to him, Jay, because we've got that conviction. I mean, it is a civil case, but he's going to owe millions of dollars on that uh, because of the, the uh, verdict on, on his company. That that he's he's in uh, deep doo doo on that, but um and there and that AG is not finished yet. That this is just chapter one, so so yes that. But but to your point, Jay, I still think that that with the program focusing the show focusing on what is he going to do because he's under duress now more ever than he's been uh, really under duress. So you guys are talking about what is what is the potential here for? for his next round of well, I'm, I'm glad he doesn't have the, the the nuclear codes under his control I'm glad of that cuz I think yeah. I think he's going to spin off into some real craziness um but here uh so so we have people pulling away from him and um and we and we have this obviously desperate move of of Kelly and Conway and for that matter the constitutional argument that he makes that seems to be desperate too but Tim, let me go to you on this one. Um, you know, yesterday on Take One, we talked about how this constitutional initiative of his is his uh, suggestion that the Constitution should be quote terminated is a way to um, you know uh, activate uh, a new a new group of of people for his base, uh, people who are more extreme, more violent, more out of their squash. 
And, um, you know, and, I, and I continue to feel that, that that was at least part of it. But the other part, let me ask you about the other part. He's testing the water, isn't he? He's testing the water to see how much pushback he's going to get on that and whether, you know, he's sure, you know, he knows that the Democrats will push back. He knows that some members of Congress will push back. But the question is, is he getting pushback from people who are in his base or could be in his base, people who are, you know, way over to the right extremists? Because uh, if that's the, if if he doesn't get pushback from them, it means, yes, Donald can try another insurrection or something along those lines to actually break the government. Um, so it's, it's more than just, um, you know, he's, he's going over the side, which I, I don't think you could make that because he's too clever to go over the side. There's always a reason for it in his perverted way of looking at things. And <clears throat> but anyway, what, what, what do you think might be the secondary purpose of that, um, of that suggestion? Well, I really agree with you that he likes to um, test the waters, uh, say outrageous things to see what kind of reaction he gets. Um, Because in Donald Trump's own little mind, he thinks that people forget. Um, No one has forgotten. Remember yesterday's show, in the introduction, I started uh, bringing out his classic hit parades of uh, of famous things he said and people find deplorable. And one of them was good people on both sides, um, veterans are suckers and losers. I mean, so there, although the thousands of things he you said that were just deplorable, there are those salient points that people do remember. But in Donald Trump's mind, they don't remember. So when he said that, you know, basically we can terminate the Constitution, it's just one more thing that he thinks the American public won't retain and won't remember. But I also think in Donald Trump's world, if I say it enough times, I'll desensitize my listening audience and they'll get used to it. And then when I do it, they won't have a reaction to it. And this is the good old fashioned, the march and the, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the march to fascism is to make outrageous statements, do outrageous things until my audience becomes desensitized and just goes along with it. So we mm-hmm. may hear more from Donald Trump as, as pertains to undermining the rule of law and the constitution, because now he's got it out once and um, what's to prevent him from doing it again. So um, I think it was uh, within the last couple of days, the Supreme Court had argument on the um, Harper case, the one, the one that would uh, change, again, for the worst, um, uh, federalism in this country, as, as uh, yeah. originally expressed by the founders. What, what uh, implications um, does the decision of the Supreme Court have on that? I mean, if they rule, for example, in, you know, uh, in, in favor of this kind of <clears throat> states' rights, uh, you know, that that make it harder to con- harder to, to preserve uh, right right rights to vote, uh, how does that affect Trump's initiative to undo the country and the Constitution? Yeah. Well, oh, okay. great thing because he he could call get on the phone as he does with many uh, state legislators that are of the MAGA GOP, of the loyal following, and uh, influence them directly, where he may not be able to get away with that so easily with the, you know, th- through the federal process. You can't just get on the phone with a Supreme Court justice. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Well, he can when he interviews them for the job, and he did. Just call um, their wives. Yeah. Well, oh, good point. Through uh, cocktail parties in Washington, D.C. Good point. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would go greatly for Donald Trump. Uh, but let's remember what uh, Neil Cotier did. He used Justice Thomas's own, um, <laughs> own, own court case against just, Justice Thomas. And what a great thing that was uh, to basically say to Clarence Thomas, hey, you can't really support this because your previous ruling in another case was just the opposite. Uh, que pasa? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> That's a good point. And so, yeah. Stephanie, you're talking about really uh, important things here when you're talking about, um, you know, the, uh, the various possibilities for indictment against him. And we've heard recently that there were yet other documents 
uh, that were um, that he had has, uh, and and we've heard that the um, um, declaration by by counsel back in early 2022 uh, that there were no more documents. They didn't have any other than they made some sort of diligent search. There were no more documents. Was untrue. Of course, the benefit of that is that those that lawyer uh, is in in trouble now. That lawyer, you know, could be indicted herself for that false statement. I don't think they have a lot of trouble getting an indictment against her for the yeah. false so, statement. They can trade that off. They can trade that off for, you know, prosecutorial purposes to get uh, information about him and to further implicate him. And, and then at the same time, um, you know, we have the committee report coming out in a few days, and they indicate that a there's more in there than we know. Maybe nothing profound, but maybe they connect the dots better. And they, they always have uh, Ari Melber's uh, Gantt chart to help them, you know. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it may be when they announce, which is going to be the 21st of December, um, that it's worse. Um, so he's got all kinds of reverses going on lately. But the question I put to you is, you know, he's Teflon, man. He almost yeah. enjoys it. He's Bonnie and Clyde, an American folk hero. For a lot of people, um, he wants to be on the headlines and he gets yeah. on the headlines, you know, and at least half the country is devoted to uh, following him and enjoying his, his machination, um, Bonnie and Clyde. So query, is any of that going to make a difference? Well, well, Jay, that that's exactly what um, I'm delighted to have you ask me, because what has not been covered and had me in a tizzy yesterday morning when I woke up because I was worried about it of the night before, which is this was a close election. I mean, barely a percentage point between Winark. Winarchy and 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 uh, Walker, what that was hugely close. I mean, that could that seems that it would be eligible for a recount. But I'm just saying. So what what does that mean? Nobody's ta talking about all the base came out. I mean, I, I, as many Republicans as probably are in Georgia must have voted for him. The count was so high. There must if there were one point four five uh, total, there must have been you know half of that or a little bit less than half, we're all the Republicans. So where are we going on that? Nobody's talking about what that means. I mean, they are slicing and dicing it in interesting ways, and you are seeing some batters and trends and everything. But nevertheless, that was way too close for comfort. And so when they called that, even with 99% of the vote in, I thought, wait a minute, this thing could turn uh, like the worm. So I think he could pick up on a lot of this and do a um, Carrie Lake thing and, and his own thing all over again because something is not being really examined here like it needs to be so what do you i'm interested to hear that as a little talk about what that means to you all i'm i'm terribly afraid of it and i think he'll use that maybe that's going to be a grip for him jay you know for him to grab onto and come back with some kind of huge bunch of hasn't yeah. happened yet i haven't seen that in the press let me let I, me I, just I, jump on that statement from stephanie's um stephanie you're right. It was too thin. And I found the Democrats celebrating way too much because uh, yeah. you looked at you looked at a quality candidate like Warnock to a horribly flawed candidate. And to your point, it was unbelievably close. It should not have been that close. It was 100,000 votes. Um, no way it should have been that close for a candidate yeah. of such horrible composition. And it, a, a candidate was a total insult to the black uh, African-American community. And uh, 100,000 votes, really? And the Democrats are, are celebrating ex excessively? Come on. Really good points, Tim. Really, yes, go on. Because that is just a fluke election. You can't say, they can't take credit for any big uh, advance um, in, you know, in, in their work in his campaign. It's a fluke. It, it was even less than 100,000. Anyway, I'd be interested to see more. Well, I'm more interested in the fact that there's been no talk about challenging it just yet. Has it been? I haven't heard anything about a challenge to that election. Uh, oh, I, I think you have to be a lot closer in the votes. 100,000. And I think it is 100,000, Stephanie. I'm, okay, I think, I I read think that it's, somewhere. A, it's a, a percentage point and that probably gets him over. Yeah. That does it. Okay, I don't well, want to I, I like to uh, I like to go to one other thing. It's uh, it's my Charles Dickens question. 
You might have heard this question before. And, you know, what is the ghost of Christmas future here? And um, let's assume, okay, that he's not kidding uh, when he takes off after the Constitution. Let's assume that, um, you know, he's satisfied with the level of feedback and he starts uh, conspiring with his old friends who are still all around him, mind you, the same people, same organizations, the same level of dedication or more, now more, more sophisticated than they were on January 6th. And, and so he wants to start another January 6th. And we've already agreed it's not going to look exactly the same. It'll be different. Uh, and likelihood is it'll be violent. Uh, and it'll be in wider around the country, not just at the Capitol. So mm -hmm. let's assume he does that. Let's assume he grabs the headlines, grabs these extremists into his new, his new base. Um, and, um, you know, nobody stands against him. And um, he, he makes some traction. Let's assume that he is, is able to somehow get in power again, whether it be uh, in the 2024 election or before. I know, you know, this is something that's hard to imagine right now, and we don't want to imagine it, but let's imagine it for this discussion. He gets back into power, okay? And he's going to try to stay in power as long as possible, uh, sort of like Xi Jinping or Putin. And he's going to uh, cut down on all kinds of civil rights right away. Uh, he's going to play to his base. He's got a transactional thing with them where he's supposed to do certain stuff. And it's all bad. Okay? So what is it going to be like? Um, there was a, there's a, in the New York Times, there was a, a video article about a, a priest in a nowhere town in, in rural Russia who spoke to a community, a, a congregation of some, something like 10 people in this nowhere town and said he opposed the war. Okay? And they came for him because he <laughs> said that. And he wound up getting interrogated for hours and hours and hours. Um, they wrote him up. Uh, they charged him. They, uh, they organized a show trial for him. Uh, they defrocked him. Um, and uh, now he's an unemployed priest. And this story is so compelling, it got into the press all over the world. So instead of 10 people, we got mm, 100 million people around the world who heard about this priest. His name is Burdan, B-U-R-D-I-N. So what I'm saying is, you know, we have freedom of the press seems to be in a low-hanging fruit target in this, um, you know, Charles Dickens scenario. But can you imagine what that scenario would be like, Tim, if, if Donald Teflon Don gets back in there? Well, we've talked about it for six years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> him in power, then out of power, back in power. And, you know, you, you framed this question by the Christmas of Christmas future, which I ask or I respond every time uh, in the same words of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. Is this the future that may be or will be? And what may be is the scenario which you've just painted. He won't waste time um, filling the agencies of, of law enforcement, the DOJ, with la lackeys, lo loyal lackeys that are more, more uh, forthright in their, their loyalty to Donald Trump, uh, certainly more than Bill Barr was. Uh, he won't waste time of trying to hamstring the media. He won't waste time trying to install, you know, thugs, um, his, his chosen thugs, in uh, the Immigration and Homeland Security Department. Uh, these are bla very bleak things. Uh, that's why the DOJ, I hate to say it, and not to act in a political way, but to act within the guidelines of the rule of law, needs to keep Donald Trump off balance. And certainly off balance enough that his, his chances of re-election are zero to nil. And um, that's gonna be only through, you know, earnest prosecution and which always starts with an indictment, which I expect to happen in two weeks or less. Hmm. Okay, but would an indictment stop him? It's the first footstep to prosecution. It'll yeah, rattle, it, it will rattle his cage. It's never been done before. Yeah, well, we have, we have Congress's report. We have the possibility of the indictment, say, within two weeks. It's going to be Christmas cheer all around if all those things happen. 
Um, on the other hand, December twenty fourth would be great for me to see it. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think that'd be good. Uh, you know, after yeah. all, it's, a, it's an important holiday. Yeah, holiday but, of joy. So, sort of but Stephanie, you know, uh, you know, you were talking earlier about, um, uh, you know, what what he could do and and how quickly uh, he could set up some kind of distraction to distract us from the distraction that distracted us from the distraction before. Uh, something that would change, yeah. you know, change the whole picture and change what people are thinking and saying and what the media is writing. Um, and you said uh, you were talking about how long it would take him to do that. Well, let me ask you this. You know, if he knows or if he watches Think Tech and he knows um, that something is going to happen by Christmas, then he can do that by Christmas, too. What are the chances that he will come up with some enormous flagranti distraction before Christmas. Well, Jay, you're, you're suggesting and insinuating that this man's following is serious. It's it's validated even in the last Georgia election. They're all there still for him. So I don't know what it is we're thinking is going to happen, but that that hasn't changed. And did he inspire the Germans? Is is this an inspiration by Donald Trump? So can he plug in, as you say, in, or Tim said internationally even, get the broader audience, the point you're making? He's got lots of pieces to plug into that. And my God, he could get the Irish all screwed up again, too. Could he? I mean, it is just amazing. So if that's the kind of big, I mean, you're making a, a suggestion here about there, there's a lot of big more stuff he could do it and it could go international. And that is just horrifying. Your, your reference uh, is is the uh, is the group in Germany that was arrested. Uh, On a January 6th. Yeah, and look what they did. They went right out. No, no, and got no within the last couple of days. Yes. There's and we got all Germany those French. Were, yeah, yeah. Well, and then there's the whole French group that came that that was standing around waiting for their election. So if you stop and think about this, it's another threat. It's, it's another jeopardy that we could be in. And is Elon Musk going to encourage that? I mean, if Elon Musk is going to put him back on Twitter and going to have that's worldwide. I mean, so th this is very frightening uh, to stop and think about the next, the, the Gantt chart going forward. What could happen, Jay? What you're you're. And you know, and and well, if he pulls off stunts like that, that are even more threatening, even more illegal, <laughs> this is an interesting question. Let's assume he does. Let's assume he pulls off another January 6th. Okay. Ugh. Judging from what we have learned from the way DOJ and Joe Biden work, what will be the government's response? And how soon will the government be able to organize that response? Now, granted. Um, you know, he doesn't have any control over the over the the police or the military or anything the way he did in January 6th. But um, uh, I would be concerned that DOJ wouldn't move fast enough on it and it would take the headlines without a countervailing response from the administration. I'd be concerned about that. But, you know, Jay, actually, though, don't we have more tools for international issues of terrorism? Maybe we have more tools there to actually bring to bear on it, which they say we have no tools domestically. And how are we going to get those inserted to handle domestic terrorism? I but hope we there's do. somebody out there thinking about these things, Stephanie. Really, This is huge. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. now that I'm thinking about it, it's really very frightening because there are groups. The groups are everywhere that would be responsive and, and may are, are influenced maybe by him. So, because Tim, I would never disagree with Stephanie. Uh, well, almost. It's part advice. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she mentioned that uh, she, you know, that she thought that Ron DeSantis uh, would be, um, you know, a, a good, um, you know, a, be a better uh, Republican candidate right now. What? What about? What about? Um, you know, a, you know, you always talk about this: an organized, strategic, um, you know, effort. Um, by the uh, by, the, the Democrats. What about some Democratic candidates? None of them rises to the level of DeSantis simply in you know name recognition. Um, but what about the Democrats? Where are they? What happened to them? Why can't they come on the stage also 
and field a candidate who would be a credible, likely candidate in 2024. Why can't they do that? And for the lack of that, you know, what is the effect on this interim period? Well, gee, Dave, we need another show for me to criticize the Democrats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me just start with meek, timid. Uh, they can't stand on their hind legs. Uh, let me just, you know, there's many adjectives I can go down the list with. Um, they just don't know how to sing off the same song page and, 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 and walk in unison like the Republicans do. And they just don't know how to do it. You got the progressive party that's always out there on a tree limb. Uh, you have the Bernie Sanders out there on a tree limb. They're not in lockstep. Um, that's one reason. Two, it's just premature. We're, we're only had two more years to go. So you got at least another six to eight months before you start getting into those conversations. And we'll see if Iowa is the first primary or it's North Carolina. Um, South, you know, South, South, South Carolina, okay. excuse me. All right, we're, we're running out of time. Let me, uh, let me go to you yeah. for final comments, Stephanie. Um, and, uh, and, you know, see what you think about um, the future. Let me, let me frame it by saying, uh, you know, Trump may be down and he has lost a certain amount of support. That's in the paper every day. But he is Teflon and he has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. And so he, he may be back. Um, and I guess the question I would put to you is, what, you know, what, what is your frame of mind at this point? Are, are we in another damn inflection point? And where's... <laughs> Where's the inflection going? Exactly. I'm, I've scared myself to death um, on the international uh, bigger bigger picture scene or what Elon Musk uh, opening up um, those resources to him um, and, and, and encouraging him and backing him. So, um, yeah, I think uh, all the points are well taken. He's got another he's not going anywhere at this point. He's getting, as I said earlier, he's getting trussed up on on this loss in um, Georgia, but it's not so big a loss. And I think he's going to rectify that view uh, of people in the country to remind everybody how close it was. And then he's bringing out his minions, Kellyanne, and there are many others. Um, and maybe Fox is going to get yanked back because Hannity was pretty going off the script there yesterday about uh, changing the Republican stance on voting um, and mail-in voting and absentee ballots. And uh, what did they also call this other thing? Harvesting voting. He wants all of the Republicans to get on board with all of that. So we'll see if Fox is going to go forward with that. But, um, yeah, probably they're waiting to hear from him, too, because there's been a bit of a lull here. So, you know, he's got his thinking cap on. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and one thing we've we've talked about, always talked about, we have to factor into any look into the Charles Dickens future is um, it's very hard to predict with all of these variables, all these people, all these strange things happening on the horizon. It's very hard to get a handle, very hard to look retrospectively from the future. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, wh whatever we say, it really depends on the right people waking up alive tomorrow morning uh, mm -hmm. and it, it excluding any remarkable, um, you know, events that we simply, simply could never, well, not likely predict. So, Tim, your final comments on all that? Um, my final comments kind of goes back to the previous question about the Democrats. And I guess what's on my mind is, for any Democratic leader that says, we like to see Donald Trump as the GOP nominee, that needs to stop because Donald Trump is wily. He's unpredictable. He could pull a rabbit out of the hat and he could be the next president again. So I'd like to hear any and all Democrats stop that kind of talk saying that we'd like to see Trump as the nominee because we think we can beat him. Um, I, I'd say you take this, the president, the uh, former president, needs to be taken off the stage and let him implode or let the DOJ do it from uh, enforcing the rule of law. But uh, let's not take the man for granted. Okay, you know, seems to me that um, there's gonna be plenty of content for us to examine, plenty of events, uh, plenty of um, knock your socks off kinds of things happening in the year 2023, which is coming soon. Uh, we can predict some of it, we can, connect the dots as it happens, but uh, very hard to get a handle on it. And, which means, <clears throat> Tim and Stephanie, we have our work cut out for us. They're, they're counting on us out there to continue to connect the dots and make sense of all this 
And I think we're going to have more, more work doing that next year. So stay happy, stay healthy, stay on Think Tech, and we'll see you next week. Uh, Tim Apicella, Stephanie Stoltdahl. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.